Now we're going to talk about what your book entitles, Northern Traditions. And one of the problems is that there's not a really good word for what we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about metalworking. And the terms that have been previously used, they used to talk about barbarian metalworking. And they decided that was a pejorative term, and so we should call it the migratory period. As a matter of fact, uh, the pictures that I'm going to be showing you and the works we're going to be discussing are actually after these northern tribes have migrated, uh, have uh, pushed their way into Western Europe, and have settled down, have settled down in one place. So let's look at what we're talking about. In the late Roman Empire and at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, there was what's often called an invasion of migratory northern tribes into Western Europe. Basically, one tribe would be pushing out uh, another tribe, and so that tribe would be coming west. Uh, and so as they move, they're, they're seeking a new homeland. They're seeking land to settle. Now, they were called the barbarians. And there are many, many different tribes. Uh, I'm not going to try to make all these little distinctions because we're going to be looking at certain artifacts, of course. There have been several explanations of the name barbarian. Essentially, for the ancient Greeks, anyone who did not speak Greek was a barbarian. They were an outsider. It's been suggested that uh, most of these tribes didn't speak the classical languages, although there certainly were some of them who did. Uh, and they were called, uh, they were said to have barbled the language. Uh, another possible explanation is because they wore barbe or beards. Uh, most of the Romans, not all, but most of the Romans were clean shaven, so these seem to be very, very hairy people. Here's a map showing you uh, some of these invasions of the Roman Empire, uh, showing you all these different uh, groups and where they went and where they moved. Uh, and uh, I don't think you need to memorize this. <laughs> but just to give you an idea of uh, the sacks of Rome, and of course there are more sacks of Rome in uh, subsequent centuries, but uh, in the fifth century, um, when we often think of the, the big sack of Rome it, in the uh, early medieval period, uh, in 410, the Visigoths, led by Alaric, sat, conquered and sacked Rome. It was a incredible shock uh, to the, the whole psyche of the Roman Empire, both of the people of the Roman Empire, because this was the first time that Rome had fallen to an outside uh, enemy in over 800 years. Uh, there were internal warfare, uh, but some other non-Roman group coming in, it was, it was unthinkable. There was another there was another sack of Rome in uh, 455. By this time, of course, uh, Rome was no longer the center of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, the capital had moved first to Milan and then in 402 to Ravenna, as you'll recall. Uh, the very end of the Roman Empire is often given as 476, when the last emperor was deposed. And you'll remember that in 493, the Ostrogoths under Theodoric conquered Ravenna, which had been the capital of the Western Roman Empire since 402. Now, when we're talking about, say, the Ostrogoths, the Ostrogoths, you'll remember, were Christians. They were Arian Christians, and they had been converted to Arian Christianity in the fourth century. So there's going to be a mixture of these uh, northern tribes. Some are Christian, uh, some are Aryan Christian, and as we'll see later on in uh, the 6th century, the Franks are converted to Orthodox Christianity, but that's yet to come. So by the end of the 5th century, there were Aust Ostrogoths, Eastern Goths in Italy. The Visigoths, or Western Goths, had moved to Spain. There were Franks in France, Switzerland, Netherlands, and parts of Germany, Anglo-Saxons in Britain, Celts, Picts, Scots in Ireland and Scotland, and the Vandals in North Africa. Now, these people had been nomadic. Uh, they may be settling down uh, in a particular area uh, at, the, it, at this time, uh, the 5th and 6th and 7th centuries, but 
the tradition of their art was for portable art. Um, if you have Vikings, uh, you have ship embellishment. We'll see that later when we talk briefly about Scandinavian art. You have weapons, you have tools, you have jewelry, things that you can carry with you. And these are the things that have survived. Um, we know that there was a very, very high level of metalworking skill. And this tradition continues after the tribes settle in their new lands. And this, of course, is what we're going to be showing you. The type of uh, pin that you're seeing here, and this is a piece of jewelry, which would be used to hold a cloak or some other garment. They're very practical. And as you can see, um, this one would have been uh, for someone who was very wealthy. We sometimes use the word brooch, but also there's a particular kind of pin that's called a fibula or fibulae. They essentially are safety pins, and you can see here uh, how the pin works. These are portable metalwork uh, with inlaid gems, and if you look at the detail, you can see that the gems are raised up high to catch the light. They are different kinds of polished stones. Uh, they were not yet faceting stones the way um, that jewelers do today. And you'll also see this uh, little row of tiny, tiny, tiny balls of metal. This is called granulation, which once again is a very, very skilled metalworking technique. The characteristics of these northern uh, metalworking traditions are that uh, they have a great deal of abstraction. There is no tradition of illusionism. There's no tradition of idealized or solid human figures as the main subject for art. That is from the classical world, from uh, ancient Greece and Rome. You see uh, decorative patterns, abstract patterns, and what uh, Jim Snyder loved to call uh, dynamic linearism. So you have this very energetic or dynamic uh, uh, patterns of linear movement, uh, sp spirals, interlaces. And then very frequently you have animal subjects, sometimes animals in combat. And to illustrate this, we have a pair of eagle fibulae from about 500. They were created in Visigothic Spain. And the technique used is a technique that we will see frequently used, is cloisonne. With cloisonne, you have a metal cavity or cell, uh, often made with uh, bent pieces of thin metal. And these are filled with molten glass, uh, which then, of course, cools and becomes hard, or with precious stones, such as granite, that have been cut to the shape. And so you have this inlay that reflects light and is very richly colored. Um, many of the glass uh, cells will have, of course, the gold beneath them. And so the light penetrates the translucent glass and reflects back. Now, people sometimes want to know what, what's the meaning of this? Is it simply you know, an animal motif that uh, you know, was used over and over again? Uh, or does it have some other meaning? And of course, we can't tell. There's not a written record attached to these artifacts. But we do know that the eagle had meaning to both non-Christian and to Christian religions. Uh, and as you can see, there is a kind of uh, round shape uh, in the center. And some people have suggested that this is a reference to the sun. Uh, so the, the idea of the eagle, which flies very, very high up toward the sun, uh, can be seen as a symbol of the sun or of uh, sun solar deities. But it also, in Christianity, is a symbol of the resurrection of Christ. And we find this in medieval bestiaries, which of course date uh, somewhat later. Uh, but sometimes we assume that some of the ideas may have been earlier. So we can't tell you whether this had a Christian or non-Christian uh, meaning, but uh, there it is. You'll remember that the Goths were Aryan Christians. And during this uh, period that we're talking about, uh, starting in perhaps the fifth, well, the fourth century, uh, and on for a number of centuries, we see the Christianization of northern tribes. Uh, the Goths had been Christian since the 4th century. 
So uh, we are also going to be seeing artifacts that are related to the church. And this is called the votive crown of Recaswinth. Uh, and a votive crown is not a crown to wear. It is a decoration for the church, uh, and it hangs over the altar. So what it is is a royal gift or a precious gift to the church. Uh, it is uh, covered with gold. It has uh, polished gems that once again are raised up to catch the light uh, and granulated borders. Recuswinth was the Visigothic king, and we know that it was given by him because uh, you can see here dangling down are letters of his name, and they spell out his name. We're now going to move to the British Isles. Uh, this would be uh, Britain and Ireland. And the art that was produced here is often called insular art, in other words, the islands of uh, Britain and Ireland. And sometimes they're called Hiberno-Saxon, Irish and Saxon. In 1939, a mound was excavated in Suffolk, Inglis, England, in East Anglia. This is the part of England that sort of uh, sticks out, if you will, uh, toward, toward the east. Um, and within it, they found uh, a ship burial. They didn't find the ship itself, as you can see from the uh, picture. What they found was the impression of a ship and the iron rivets that held the chinkers, or the planks, of the ship together. This find contained rich burial goods. We're going to look at some of them and coins, and the coins allowed people, because there were dates, the, the coins could be dated, and so they allow us to date this ship burial to the first half of the seventh century. For a while, they wondered whether this was um, a cenotaph, in other words, a uh, burial without a body. Maybe the body had been lost at sea or somehow was unable to be recovered, uh, and so you know, they had a burial for the um, king or the uh, important warrior. But uh, since then they have done chemical studies and they have found chemicals in the soil that show that there once was a body there and they believe that the body completely disintegrated because the soil is quite acid. There were of course subsequent excavations. Um, there are 17 mounds on the site and they have found a number of burials. And if you would like to read more about them, the, uh, you can uh, Google or uh, do a search for the Sutton Hoo Society, or uh, I think it's suttonhoo.org, and uh, they tell you about this and they also uh, give you uh, links to other sites. This is a reconstruction of how they think the burial may have uh, been laid out. Uh, of course, it's based on the impression of the ship and also uh, where the grave goods were found. Uh, it is the grave of a warrior, undoubtedly, because of the, the artifacts that have been found are the um, jewelry, the weapons, the helmet of a warrior. Now, who was it? So they start looking at uh, different uh, kings who have been recorded at that period. Um, oftentimes they'll say that it probably was King Rainwald. Uh, and he was a pagan king who did convert to Christianity for a short period of time and then went back to his pagan beliefs. Um, his son was another suggestion. There were about four kings that they think it might be. Uh, so the answer is we don't know. Here you see the helmet fragments and the reconstruction. Of course, the fragments have been laid out on this form in the shape of the helmet. Uh, and then uh, you have a reconstruction of the helmet because all you have are these pieces from which to work. Gold fares better. That's one reason it's such a precious metal because it doesn't uh, disintegrate and tarnish uh, the way other metals do. And uh, there are a number of golden artifacts. Uh, one of them was the golden buckle from Sutton Hoo. Uh, it has a hollow compartment in it, uh, and it's about five inches long. As you can see by looking at it, it displays that characteristic of dynamic linearism. 
Uh, in some places, you have the abstract interlace, just simply uh, curving uh, thick lines. And other places, if you look closely, you'll see what seem to be eyes, as though there's a head of uh, some kind of animal, maybe a bird. Uh, and uh, then the neck or the body, or are they serpents, because they have these long intertwined uh, bodies that uh, are more interlaces. One of the suggestions is that the little uh, hollow area um, could have been used as a reliquary box. And of course, in that case, you would imagine a warrior uh, thinking that the, the, whatever it might be, say the piece of bone from a saint might help protect him in battle. The interlace pattern, you can see that very clearly. Uh, and the intertwined animals, you see uh, what appeared to be the heads of some kind of beastie uh, that are biting their tails or the bodies. And these are extremely intricate, energetic patterns. Now, the gold has uh, Nelio work in it. That's why it's, you can see the pattern so, uh, so clearly. Nelio is this black material. It's made out of sulfur mixed with uh, another metal, such as silver, lead, or copper. And that fills the incised area or the crevices on the metal, and it highlights the design. So that is the uh, sort of black lines that you see uh, that uh, highlight the, uh, the engraved work. And here's a close-up of one of the uh, bird heads. It looks like a bird of prey, an eagle, a falcon, something like that. And you can also see the technique of granulation around the boss. Just here's more details of it. More heads, more intertwined forms. One of the other great finds uh, was the Sutton Who purse lid. Now, actually, all that was left were the metal pieces. Uh, and that white area you see uh, is reconstruction. They assumed that there was something like ivory, uh, bone, possibly wood, as the uh, lid. And of course, this is how the, uh, approximately how the decorations were found. Um, and so they have a hinge on it, uh, and it would have been attached to either a leather or a fabric bag in which the coins were placed. And of course, they found the coins. We said that was how they were able to date uh, the, uh, the burial. Now, those parts, whether it's fabric, leather, ivory, uh, wood, would have all uh, disintegrated, rotted away. Uh, and, but the metalwork survived. So let's take a closer look at it. You can see a combination of animal forms, which we're looking at here, or zoometric forms, uh, which have become somewhat abstracted. Uh, cloisonne here with the uh, garnets that are cut to shape. Uh, and uh, you see at the top these animals whose snouts have become extremely elongated along with their tails and legs, and then they form an abstract interlace pattern. Uh, down below, you're seeing uh, these birds of prey, probably eagles or falcons, which have captured a duck. And uh, once again, you're just extremely fine work. This detail, there's two of them, uh, has caused a lot of speculation. Uh, it seems to be a man between two animals. Uh, it's been suggested that this is a man who is uh, being beset by wolves and he's going to be uh, torn apart by wolves. Uh, it's also been suggested that is a kind of family emblem, uh, a reference to the name Wolfenguy, uh, or the wolf's family. And then others have seen in it a Christian emblem, uh, a reference to Daniel in the lion's den. And one of the reasons is because they do have on Christian artifacts um, some images that look some, somewhat like this. And then you have uh, designs that are purely uh, abstract, uh, with uh, just intricate patterns that are made out of cloisonne, uh, but do not have the animal heads or the animal shapes. Other artifacts uh, are these shoulder clasps. You can see how they pin together. 
and you have the geometric uh, patterns made out of cloisonne and mille fiore. Uh, mille fiore, uh, those little uh, geometric shapes that uh, look like checkerboards or little flowers. Um, what you do is you take rods of glass and you fuse them together. You stretch them out, of course, while they're hot, <laughs> and then you slice them horizontally and you have these uh, beautiful decorative, uh, decorative uh, patterns. And if you look at the borders, you're seeing more of the entwined animal forms. Here's the end. Once again, uh, simplified in entwined animals, garnets, enamel. Just very rich work. Um, there is uh, a creature <laughs> that has been called a dragon uh, that they believe uh, was part of the fitting or a decoration uh, on a shield. And as you can see, they found a number of these and they're sort of laying them out in the place that they found them. Uh, the shield itself would have disintegrated. It was not, no longer there. In your text, uh, they also refer to the hanging bowl, uh, which is made out of bronze, as you can see. And within it, it has uh, these decorations. It's called uh, escutcheons, is what your book called them. Uh, and they also have uh, the mille fiore designs. Mille fiore simply means a thousand flowers. And as we said, you put the glass rods, to, you take different colored glass uh, in rods, uh, you put them together so that the end would form a pattern, uh, and then you fuse them together, you heat them, uh, you stretch them out while they're still warm, uh, still hot, and then you can slice them horizontally to make patterns. Now, here's something that's not in your text. Um, your textbook was written uh, after these were discovered. There was another Anglo-Saxon hoard of golden artifacts discovered in July of 2009. Simply a guy who liked to go out with his metal detector, he was a hobbyist, an amateur, and he discovered this huge hoard of uh, golden artifacts. Now, it was not a burial. Um, in fact, many of the pieces were damaged or folded over, or they seem to have been uh, ripped from weapons. Uh, a lot of sword hilts and things like that, pieces of, pieces of weapons. So the speculation is that this might be uh, warrior's trophies, the hoard of a warrior, uh, who either in some fabulous battle or over an entire lifetime has uh, put together these treasures. Okay, so I'm just going to show you these. Um, one of the things that I find is really interesting is you can see that in many cases, uh, one of the things that's very interesting about these to me is that the photographs were taken uh, before they had been completely cleaned. I mean, obviously, they've gotten some of the dirt off, so you can see what they are, uh, but there's still a lot of dirt holding to this. It will be many, many, many years before everything has been completely preserved and studied. Um, and you can see that they've also shown you diagrams of a warrior and where some of these artifacts uh, would have been worn. Uh, so these are uh, fittings from a dagger. And you see the same thing, thing we've seen before with uh, cloisonne, uh, interlace patterns, and of course, as we said, the gold holds up well. Uh, there's a little boss uh, and uh, she, uh, fittings for the shield, maybe decorations for the shield. Uh, and there were even some things that were uh, Christian. There were, uh, there was a folded cross, and here you see a pectoral cross. That means a cross that would be worn say, on a chain around a neck. Um, and there was a golden belt, and on it there was a biblical inscription, suggesting that whoever originally worn these were Christian. Uh, and here's just a few other artifacts. Here is uh, a uh, piece of metal that's shaped like a seahorse. It's been suggested that that would have been a decoration on a shield. There is a boss that is made with the mille fiore uh, technique, and uh, down there you can see a sword fitting, uh, perhaps a hilt, uh, which has the animal interlace on it. In 
And now we're going to look at one of the great uh, metalworking treasures of Ireland. Uh, this is known as the Tara brooch. It dates from the 8th century. Uh, it's made out of gilded silver that has been uh, richly decorated. And as you can see, it's using many of the techniques that we uh, have already seen, granulation, inlaid nilio, uh, and cloisonne techniques. And here we're going really close up. You can see these spiral forms and the interlace forms. And uh, this is a black and white um, image, but I think uh, some things will show up better in black and white because of the contrast. So you can see here some of the, uh, uh, the very fine patterns.